Winston Churchill was often quoted or misquoted to have said, never give up. But the truth was that he didn't say that. He actually said, never give in, never give in, never, 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 never in nothing great or small, large or petty, never give in except the convictions of honour and good sense. Now, following our graduation, you know, we went on a 12-day crazy drive, and I was a driver from LA to my son called Las Vegas. And then on to Grand Canyon and down to you know, Phoenix, Arizona, and then all the way back to LA. I drove 1,500 miles. I think I qualified to be a Grab driver, right? That would be around 2,500 kilometers. And my son said that that would be like driving from Singapore to Cebu City, our second home. And the last stretch, which was on Father's Day two Sundays ago, was a challenging one because I was tired by then. And the heat was intense at 43, 42, 43 degrees. And the final stretch as we were making our way back to LA would be like 400 miles. Can you imagine? At my age, driving 400 miles at the end of a long, long trip. My wife turned to me, I guess she was being encouraging, and she said that you are a man of perseverance. I don't think she meant that I had to persevere over our last 33 over years of marriage. She has been a wonderful wife. And I pondered about the word perseverance. And all the more so because the week the Sunday before that, that was the weekend I went for our graduation. Twice, two speakers, different speakers, different setting, one in my graduation, another one in the church service that we attended, preached from the same Bible text on perseverance, or alluded to it. And that's what I'm going to share with you this morning, Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked up for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Can I ask you to rise with me, grab the hand of somebody beside you as we pray together. Sorry to do that. You know, can I ask you to do that? And I feel that this morning the Lord has a word for many of us. I sense that many of us feel a, a, a weariness in your spirit, if not in your body. And I believe that God, this morning, as I was worshipping with you early on, I could see in my eyes of faith, rivers of water rushing into this body of believers. And God wants your spirit to be lifted up this morning. Father, I pray that as your word go forth, I pray, O oh God, for the quickening of the spirit. Lord, you know your people. They are your sheep. And this morning we come, O oh Lord, as we sang a while ago, thirsting for the touch of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, O oh God, that you anoint your unworthy servant once more to declare your truth. And may your truth go forth and set us free to become the people you have called us to be. Break down every resistance, break down every distraction. And I pray, O oh God, that your word will have effect on each and every one of us, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We bless you in Jesus' mighty name. We give thanks and we pray. Everybody say? Amen. All right. God bless you. Now, the original word in the New Testament for the word that we have, perseverance, was actually used 31 times. And of which 13 times, like the one that we are using here, is perseverance. The other seven times, or the rest of the times, you know, seven of them use as patient, or rather endurance, and five, more specifically, patient or great endurance. 
So you put that together, use interchangeably perseverance or endurance. And the Word of God, I believe, through this passage of Scripture first and foremost, is telling us the exhortation to perseverance. And I sense, even as I came and pray about this service, God wants you to be encouraged. You don't have to give in. Come and touch someone beside you and say, don't give up. The writer of Hebrews says we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Hosts of witnesses will be our understanding. Now, the immediate reference is to the champions of faith in the previous chapter. We think of them as spectators often, cheering us from the stands, watching us running. Now, this may be true in one sense, but they are referred to as witnesses, literally martyrs. Meaning to say that these people, they bear testimony to the reality and validity of their faith. So I say to you this morning, it is not so much of these witnesses looking at us or to us as it is we looking to them. They have run their race with perseverance through many trials, tragedies, and triumphs. These are very ordinary imperfect, fallen people who trusted God to the very end. Sometimes we look at these people and say, oh, we can never measure up. Can I remind you that among them are liars, murderers, adulterers, a drunk, a prostitute, a fornicator. Did I hear an amen somewhere? Yet, they persevere through flaws, faults, failures in their faith. These champions of faith can be classified into two categories. Those who believe despite the circumstances. And we read a big chunk of them in the first part of chapter 11. And we like that. They believe in spite of circumstances and came true. But may I remind you, there was also the second category of people those who obey despite the consequences. And you and I are called to follow in their footpaths. They left behind footprints of faith for us to persevere in our race. And this, if you recall, was the inspiration behind Steve Green. Those in my generation will remember the song. Remember the song, May all who come behind us find us faithful. Thank God for these biblical witnesses and other real-life heroes of faith who encourage us. Now, what is encouragement? What is exaltation? And there are two things we are encouraged to throw off, to run the race for which we are centered. Everything that hinders, anything that distracts and disrupts unnecessary Wait. Now, Paris Olympics around the corner. Can you imagine seeing somebody put on jacket, heavy boots, going down to the running track, the race? Recently, the all-time tennis great, Roger, Roger Federer, was in a graduation gown. And he was there because he was honored, given an honorary, honorary doctorate. And he was in this gown, and as you can see, even with his racket, and he said that he was outside of his comfort zone. Can you imagine this guy playing tennis with this gown on? And yet I suspect many of us have a lot of excess baggage. And we wonder why we're having problems in our race. Everything that hinders can be any activity or association. Relationships, friendships can handicap. Sports, entertainments, hobbies, habits can distract. Studies, careers, possessions can disrupt us. You know the thing that hinders you, throw it off. Amen? Come on, tell the one beside you, throw it off. Don't ask him or her what that is. You know the thing that weighs you down. 
in the parable of the sower, if you recall, Jesus explains not only the first and the second seed, which we all understand clearly, but especially the third and the fourth types of ground. Jesus says in Luke Gospel, he says, those on the rocky ground are those who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. And we have seen that. And I salute you for reaching out each one, rich one. We never know who they are. Some will be going through testing, but don't give up on them. Amen? Now, Jesus went on to explain, the seed that fell among thorns stand for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked, Choked by what? Lives, worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. And I suspect that this has afflicted more believers than the other category of persecution. I recall the first time I ever came and invited to share here, I think it was your mission event. We were talking about that. And one of your pastors, if I'm not wrong, from China, and we had a conversation. And he was telling me that today, and that was about five or six years ago, he said that today our problem is no longer persecution in China. He said our problem is money. <laughs> money. And you see, brothers and sisters, many of us may not be out and out doing things that are not right, that weigh us down. But you and I can be caught with worries, cares of this life, riches, or the pursuit of riches, and pleasures. Las Vegas. All right? My son called it deliberately because his girlfriend's iPhone was stolen away. All right? So, sin that so easily entangles is the next that we need to throw off. Anything that trips and traps. Now, the sin that so easily entangles is not specifying, and it's probably the sin of unbelief. It is an unwillingness to trust God and enter the freedom and victory Jesus has promised you. Beloved, you and I are caught into a life of freedom and victory. Amen? But yet many of us, you say, you don't understand the kind of obstacles I have in life. You don't understand my weaknesses, what I have to deal with. I don't. But I say to you, you can trust God. You can believe God to bring you in the land of blessings. Amen? Now, can you trust God to overcome the obstacles, weaknesses in your race of life? I can't run the race for you. Pastor Roden cannot run for you. My wife cannot run my race for me. He, she has her challenges. I have my obstacles. But the same God whom we serve and whom the heroes and heroines of faith serve in chapter 11, the same God is able to bring us through. I like what the father of the boy with seizures said to Jesus. Remember Jesus was up in Mount Transfiguration? And he came down, the disciples were all, you know, frustrated because they could not do a deliverance. And Jesus asked the man essentially what was the problem, long story short. You know, Jesus, he was saying to Jesus, if you can do anything, heal my son. And Jesus said, can I do it? Or something to the effect. And a man basically said to Jesus, I believe, but help my unbelief. And I find that so helpful. I don't know about you. Through these 40 some years of running this Christian faith race, often time I have to say to the Lord, I believe, but please help my unbelief. And this morning, Jesus is here. Amen? He's here to help our unbelief. Can I ask you this morning, as gently as I can, what is hidden in your closet? Never mind about your neighbor's closet. What is in yours? What is lurking 
in your heart. They say there are three selves or three me's. There is a public self that people know. My persona. People understand, people see, and people even applaud or sometimes criticize. There is a private self that this lady with me for the almost last 40 years since our courtship, she knows things that you do not know. All right? It's okay. She is welcome to join me. <laughs> there is a private self that only your closest know you. But may I say to you, there is your secret self that only God knows. And you cannot fool God. When we are flying back, don't know whether is it a blessing or a pain. With internet connection in a cabin, we were connected. And we received, as we were about to land, the shocking news of a mega, mega church pastor having to step down. And mind you, for some sins that were committed 40 over years ago. And it's not for me here to pass a judgment or to make a call. I don't know enough information. But it seems to me that apparently things were not totally clear up for one reason or another. And it had resurfaced or given the room to resurface. And as I was still recovering, because I listened to his podcast quite a bit, as we were still recovering, as we got back, the next thing, another, again, high-profile Pastor, resign, step away, citing past sin, unnamed. So I say to you, throw off the thing that entangles your life. Now this morning, I want to share with you the example of perseverance. Or shall I say, the example of perseverance. You see, we have all those heroes in the preceding chapter. But Jesus here in Hebrews 12, verse 2, is held as a supreme example and ultimate model of perseverance. As we say, we often look at those people in heroes, as heroes and heroines of faith in chapter 11, coming from the Old Testament. But the true hero of the Old Testament is God who use very imperfect and fallen people. Even now, very imperfect and fallen evangelists and pastors. You know, Jesus is the example, the example. Revelation tells us that he is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. And as we just read in our text, he endured the cross, scorning its shame sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He was tempted, Hebrews tells us early on, in every way that we are. Never entertain the thought that you are a special case. Have you come across people who say, oh, pastor, you don't understand my temptation. Mine's like nobody else's temptation. Wow. Jesus was tempted like we are. All right? Do you have sexual temptation? So did Jesus. I'm not being blasphemous. You have temptation about feeling dejected because of disappointment, betrayed. So did Jesus. He did not sin. Now, can I say to you, Jesus as the author and finisher, or shall I say pioneer and perfecter, he shows us perfectly how to persevere in faith to the very end. Be inspired, be encouraged by the examples in the Old Testament and also by living testimony and thank God that we are in the body of Christ. When we come together, it's not just feeling good, but it's provoking one another, encouraging each other. Amen? But more than that, we have Jesus because the Bible tells us while Jesus lived on earth, 
he prayed to God, asked God for help. He prayed with loud cries and tears to the one who could have saved him from death. And his prayer was heard because he trusted God even though Jesus was the Son of God, he learned obedience by what he suffered. And because his obedience was, he didn't give up. He had a race like no other race. But the Bible tells us Jesus' obedience to the Father was perfect right to the very end so that he is able to give eternal salvation to all who Obey him. Let us be reminded that Jesus on the cross, his enemies insulted him, taunted him, asking him, Come down from the cross. They mocked him that he trusted, he trusted in God. People walked by and insulted Jesus, saying, You are, you say you destroyed the temple, build up again in three days. So save yourself. Come down from that cross. If you are really the Son of God, the leading priest and the teachers of the Lord, the Jewish elders also poking fun at Jesus. He saved others. He can't save himself. He says the king of Israel, he feeds the king. Let him come down now from the cross. Then we will believe in him and listen to what or what they mock. He trusts in God. So let God save him now. If God really wants him, he himself say, I'm the son of God. Mocking, taunting, ridiculing, insulting our Lord. Now the irony, I remind you, was that Jesus could have come down from the cross. Huh? He could have. In fact, he said, if I wanted to, I could have called 12 legions of angels to my rescue. But then, if Jesus had come down from the cross, you and I would have been lost forever. The truth was that Jesus trusted in God and God gave, God saved him not only from the grave, God exalted Jesus to the place of highest honour. Oh man, you are very excited. I say Jesus is exalted to the place of highest honor. Grave could not hold Jesus Christ. Are you there? Now, when you think about that, Jesus persevered, the Bible says, because of the joy set before him. Now you say, what joy was that? It was not the joy to return to the glory of the Father. He had perfect joy before His incarnation. And He spoke of the joy and glory of the triune God before His crucifixion. He knew that He would experience the joy of exaltation after His resurrection. So what joy was Jesus talking about that was set before Him as He persevered in His faith and endured the cross? Let me read Remind you, it was the joy of having us and multitudes of believers sharing His glory in the presence of God forever. That was the joy set before Jesus Christ as He endured the cross. He persevered to the very end. Hebrews 2, 10 and 10. The 13th says that in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer, the word again, the author of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy of the same family, Jesus is not ashamed to call you and I brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters in the assembly. I will sing your praises and again I will put my trust in him and again he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Jesus died on the cross so that you and I can be in the presence of his father forever. That was his joy. God has given us many models or mentors in life to follow and thank God for them. They are placed in the different stages of our life's journey, or shall I say seasons of life, to grow and mature in our faith. But they are not perfect. They are not sinless. People fail 
and falter. Parents can fail. Spouse or spouses can fail. And children can fail. Teachers and bosses can fail. Friends and colleagues can fail. Pastors and leaders, leaders can fail. Even your pets, your doggies can fail. I'm amazed at the number of people now pushing trolleys, not babies, but puppies. <laughs> if you are pinning your hope on them, bring you joy. And let me tell you, the dog life is not very long. <laughs> I kept two dogs, big dogs, German shepherds. We cried when they died, or one of them died. <laughs> but Jesus never fails. Oh man, you didn't hear that. I say, our Lord never fails. Men can fail, women can fail, organization can fail, your government can fail. I pray not, but Jesus never fails. There's a dangerous thing, election coming out. All right. So I say to you, follow your mentors, coaches, and leaders, but focus on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Him as your finish line and life goal. And 40 some years ago, I learned driving. Thank God the instructor taught me well. If not, I would not have survived the 1,500 mile drive. And he was a Chinese speaking instructor. You know what he used to tell me? <laughs> Translated, when you're driving, you know, keep your eyes in front, see far, far. Thank you, bro. You all right? This old uncle might trip and fall over, right? <laughs> and this instruction or advice of him served me well. This 1,500 miles, I tell you, my wife tried to feed me and engage me in conversation, but I said, no, I shall not be distracted. <laughs> Focus. Eyes in front. See far, far. Kan yuan yuan. <laughs> Some of you, you are looking at your feet. Some of you, you are looking at your present circumstances. You are looking at your trials. You are looking at your tormenting teacher. I'm not talking to Pastor Roden yet. You are looking at the people who have failed you or you have failed them. See far, far. Look to Jesus. Yes, follow your friends, follow your pastors, follow your leaders, follow whoever God placed over you. Follow your wife even. Because wife has the best instructions for husband. Like she's going to smile at me very soon to tell me I'm going too long. But look to Jesus. Including those of you online, forgot about you. Look to Jesus. Amen? Hey, we can talk and sing and preach about perseverance as I'm attempting to do this morning. But you know what? We experience Perseverance by persevering. You experience perseverance by not giving up or giving in. There's no other way. You go on the grind, walk through the valley, climb the mountain, crawl through the tunnel, weather the storm, walk through the fire if you must. We are to consider Jesus who endured such opposition from sinful men. Meaning, we are to persevere in dealing with fallen people who challenge and conflict with us. And can I say to you, some of the hardest people are those closest to us physically and emotionally. Now, don't look at your neighbor. Isn't that so true? Jesus said that in this world, we will have celebration. Yes. But most specifically, what did he say? We will have... We all know that Jesus says, and this gospel, and I like this as a missionary, Jesus says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. As a missionary, this is one of my favorite verses. 
We want to see the gospel broadcast to the ends of the world, right? Hello? This church is a missions-minded church. I just talked to our brother who just came back from Cebu, all right? We want to see the gospel being proclaimed to all people groups. But do you know what Jesus said before this verse? He says, and then many will fall away, betray one another, hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness, even in sunny Singapore, because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who, come on, say, the one who, not halfway, not quarter way, not three quarter way, all the way. And this is what our Lord left with us. Paul calls on the believers among churches, having planted all those churches. He says, said, you will be going through many tribulations. And I assure you, many, many Christians don't like to hear that part. We want the blessings of God. And I have no problem. I love the blessings of God. And we are walking and enjoying the blessings of God. Even this last trip. That was our first family vacation in five years. After COVID, that is. Paul. No less than the great apostle Paul said, through many tribulations. Paul himself claims, I persevered in demonstrating among you the marks of an apostle. And listen to what he says to his son in the faith. He charges Timothy to endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And to keep your heads in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of ministry. He is talking to all of us who are involved in ministry, one way or another. You don't have to be in full time, I don't even like that term, but you are involved as a small group leader, evangelism, outreach, endure hardship. When we consider Jesus in our hardship, we will not grow weary and lose heart. And that's what I feel as I pray over this message. That God wants to bring about a refreshment. For many of you feel that your journey has been tough and rough. Many of you feel that your task is overwhelmingly burdensome. Be it church work or be it in your secular, I don't like the other term again, work, your career. Many of you feel that your relationship is hitting a dead end. Do you feel there is no more point or energy in staying on in your relationship? Some of you in a marriage situation or the job or the ministry that you are involved in. Do you feel hopeless, battling chronic or terminal Eunice. I can tell you the number of times And I'm talking about good Christians Among them colleagues Who have to deal with cancer One young man Our IT colleague Who was given up to die Stage 4 cancer But God came through for him This last week His birthday celebration He got up to testify It's been 2 years now And he's clear of cancer marker But in the process, I'm sure that he was going through the agony. But he persevered. Do you doubt that a lost loved one or a backslidden friend will ever come to Jesus? Never give in. Keep pressing on. You know what? I found this. As we persevere in our walk with God, God preserves our faith in God. Did you get me? I used to get confused when I was younger with words persevere, persevere and preserve. As we persevere in our walk with God, He preserves our faith in God. Someone says, when you come to the end of a rope, tie a knot, hang in there. I'm not too sure whether that works all the time, depending on the quality of the rope, right? 
But the idea is to persevere. You know what I found out all these years? Truthfully, not just the last four years with Fuller. I learned much. I'm not trying to knock it off. But it was agonizing. But I found more than just the last four years, the last 40 over years of walking with the Lord, that perseverance builds character, brings maturity and godliness. Are you there, folks? We want to mature. We want to have character. We want to be Christ-like or godly. It is through the path of perseverance. My son is not here. We happen to know your pastors and uh, Pastor Douglas who brought us in the connection. And he knows our story. Nine years ago, my son, 16 years old, had to be uprooted, born and raised in the Philippines, 16 years old. Came to Singapore, didn't even know how to order laksa. He talked to the hawker, hawker uncle couldn't understand him. He had to come back, traumatized. He had to go through two polytechnics. The first one was a fiasco. That's why my wife and I came back the following year. Went through two polytechnics. Went through the military service. We were a bit jittery. We know of many horror stories of kids raised abroad. It was a total disaster. He went through. He liked it so much, he wanted to sign on. You know, I was praying, God, please don't let him sign on. Thank God he answered my prayer. Sorry, I know there are some colonel or high ranking officers here. All right, please. I was a military officer myself. All right, but I said, no, I have done my part, but don't. I'm not going to sign on. Please don't let my son sign on. He just finished his university studies. But you know, sometime last year, he came up to me as a 24 year old young man then. He hugged me and he sobbed like a little boy. I didn't know the details, but he said, Dad, I have sent in 50 applications for internship placement. And I finally landed up with this one. I know my boy. My wife and I knew this little boy. We knew how tofu he was. <laughs> but for him to press in and not to give up, and you know what? The beauty of it, this internship placement, which he got since middle of this time, uh, around this time last year, before he finished university, they said, we want to sign you on. Before he even took his final exam. And I look at China News Asia and our university graduates are waiting six months to a year. I feel sorry for them, but I feel very happy for my son. Perseverance. Don't give up. If I can imitate Winston Churchill, I'll never give up. No, that was not what he said. Never give in. Never, 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 never give in. We have Christ. Can you rise with me? We have Jesus seated at the right hand of our heavenly Father. If it is not enough that He died for you, He came to life and is right now praying for you. You think your problems are humongous. You think your relationship has come to an end and you have thrown the power. You think your illness is so bad. Jesus is praying for you. Don't give up on a loved one. Just last month, we attended the funeral of my godmother, very dear to me. I've been talking to her for um team years. Brought him, brought her, sorry, to the camp. My mother-in-law got water baptized. She refused. At the age of 85, she gave her heart to Jesus Christ and was water baptized. Last month, at the age of 100, went home to be with Jesus. Never give up. This morning, I don't know where you are at. Jesus knows. 
before I turn over to Pastor Roden or whoever taking over, can I ask you to close your eyes, lift up your hands wherever you are, and say, God, you not know only have died for me, you raised your son to life for me. And what more? The Holy Spirit. The eternal comforter is within me. And all of heaven's resources are at my disposal because of my connection to Jesus Christ. And Father, right now, I pray for many who are heartbroken. I pray for many who are downtrodden. I pray for many, O oh Lord, feeling despair, feeling hopeless, feeling hitting end of the road. Right now, as they cry out to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, relieve the burdens, O oh God, right now. Release them, O oh God, from the bondage right now. Whatever sin that entangles this morning, O oh God, let it be gone. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray, O oh God, right now there be an infusion of your Holy Spirit. Lord, a release of faith once again. We do not have to give up because Jesus Christ never gave up. And He doesn't give up on any one of us or any of our situation. I pray for sicknesses. The doctor has pronounced the death sentence as good as it is. Right now, by His stripes, you are healed. Receive your healing. Receive this morning the reconciliation in your marriage. Receive this morning the restoration of the broken relationship. Receive strength for your work. Receive joy for the ministry God has called you unto. What He has done for you on the cross. Is more than enough. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy to give up. This morning, you are more than conquerors. You are champions because of Jesus Christ. Thank you, dear Lord. Thank you, dear Lord. While well, all eyes are closed, I want to give an invitation for those of you who have not made Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You may have come to church or to other places of meeting or worship. But you know in your heart of heart, you do not have a relationship with God. You may have had it one time. But for some reason, things happen, you have left. And you only know it in your own heart. Whether are you in right relationship with Jesus? No one looking around our respect for our friends here. But this morning you say, Pastor, I need Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I need to turn over my life to Him to be my Savior and my Lord. I want to know for sure my sins are forgiven and I have a place in heaven. No one looking around, it will be my privilege to pray with you. Would you slip up your hand quickly so that I can see? Anyone here? Anyone here this morning? Yes, God bless you, sister. Anyone else? Anyone else online, just raise your hand. I'm not going to prolong this time. But if you want Jesus to come into your heart, would you be so courageous to raise up your hand and say, I want Jesus to come into my life. Anyone else? Hallelujah. Let us pray together. For our dear sister so boldly, or for any one of you who did not leave your hand, but you want to make a decision. Bible says that, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be safe. Not may be safe. You will be safe. And even for those of you online, right at home, in the comfort of that room, or wherever you are watching this service, you say, I need Jesus to come into my heart. Join me in this prayer. Mouth the words, but mean it from your heart. Let's pray together with our dear sister here. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you that you died for my sins. I'm not worthy, but you are the worthy one. I open my heart. I receive you into my heart. I surrender my life to you. 
from this day on, you are my Lord, you are my Savior. And your word says, I'm a child of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us thank God. Praise you, Jesus. Amen.